Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Instacart HK. Today, we're doing something a little bit different from what we normally do. As you can see, I'm not starting today's episode with a beautiful classic car next to me as I always do. Instead, I'm at home in my own man cave speaking to you one-on-one. -on -one because today is the first ever episode of Instacart Talk, where I'm going to talk about what sort of cars in Hong Kong secondhand market today that I think will be future classics and that I think are good value to buy now. Now, just to be clear, this episode is not about speculating or flipping cars. We're not, I'm not going to tell you about cars that I speculate. Uh, the value would go up two folds, three folds, four folds in the next you know, four or five years. Nor am I going to talk about cars where the value has already gone up. So for example, I won't be talking about any air-cooled Porsches because prices of those have gone crazy for the past few years already. Nor am I going to talk about million dollar plus uh, JDM special edition cars like the 22B, uh, NSX-R or Nismo GTR. Instead, I want to talk about second-hand Hong Kong cars uh, that have the potential of being future classics that will be recognized and appreciated by fellow car enthusiasts for years to come. And most importantly, um, they, their values are, are very good now, I think. And they, are, they will really give you the bang for the buck of money versus enjoyment. Now, um, before we start, I want to clarify first, all the prices that I'll be talking about today will be in Hong Kong dollars. And I will only be looking at cars that secondhand uh, models are readily available in Hong Kong. So I won't be looking at any secondhand cars in the UK or in Australia, uh, mainly because the, the there's just a different sort of um, cars that are available in those uh, markets and in Hong Kong. So this means that the list that I'll be um, talking about today, the list of cars, would mostly be um, modern classics and less um, you know, actual classic cars from the 60s, 70s, you know, and so on. This is mainly because um, the secondhand classic car market in Hong Kong, at least in the open market, is um, not that comprehensive in Hong Kong. Um, so there's no point for me to tell you, oh, you should consider buying a, a Triumph Spitfire or a Porsche 914. Um, when listings of these cars in Hong Kong would be you know, close to non-existent or there will only be one or two listings at most so you won't have much to choose from. So it's going to be mostly modern classics that are readily available in Hong Kong that I would consider myself if I were in the market. Now finally, before we go to the list of cars, uh, I have separated the um, cars into different price uh, brackets. So the first bracket would be the cheapest 50 to 100K Hong Kong dollars. The second would be 100 to 200K. And then the third would be 300 to 500K. And finally, the $1 million mark. Now, let's start with the cheap, cheaper end of the cars um, first with the price bracket of 50 to 100K. I think the first car that I would recommend for this price range um, that I would consider and I have considered and bought would be the Porsche 986 Boxster. Um, now, as you, many of you would know, the first generation Boxster, especially the non-S version like mine, has dipped below um, 100,000 Hong Kong dollars for a while already. It's actually one of my favorite cars in my, in my garage, uh, mainly because for such a cheap price, you have a Porsche, you have a flat six um, engine uh, soundtrack and it's open top and don't forget that the Boxster also um, is quite significant in Porsche history it is widely recognized and admitted by Porsche that this was the model that saved Porsche because Porsche wasn't doing very good you know back in the early mid 90s and they really needed a, a model to save the brand and it resulted in the Boxster which was immediately a, a, a top seller 
And today, actually this year, um, the Boxster is celebrating 25th anniversary of its production. Um, so, you know, you, for such a cheap car, you get a reasonably reliable, uh, reasonably quick Porsche with historical significance. What more can you ask for? Um, the, the next one uh, would be a JDM car, which I think is good value uh, for, for between 50 to 100K. And that is the Nissan 350Z. Um, I think mainly because the Fair Lady model, the Z model, is very well known, it's very important in Nissan history, starting with the 240Z. And um, the car was also, the 350Z is also you know, beautifully designed. I think it was uh, designed by the, an American designer. For under $100,000, if you can find a manual one, you have a manual V6, 280 horsepower, rear wheel drive car. What more can you ask for? Another manufacturer that I would recommend is Mercedes-Benz. And this would be a, a recurring theme because as you all know, uh, Mercedes-Benz don't really do well with their secondhand prices because most of their models are mass produced. That means that some of the very nice models can actually be uh, had for very cheap now. And I think at this 50 to 100,000 price range, there are a few that I would recommend. First being the uh, SL uh, L129 generation, that's the late 80s, uh, early 90s, um, all the way up to the 2000 generation. Um, I, I love those models. Uh, I had two myself before. And this was from an era where People called the Mercedes models you know, over-engineered, where Mercedes, they were made, building cars that were tough as tanks. They were thinking about build quality before costs. From my experience, they are um, quite reasonable, uh, reasonably reliable, and it doesn't cost too much you know, relatively to, to, to uh, maintain and upkeep them. And the SL129 is definitely one of the most iconic uh, model of Mercedes of that period. Uh, their prices, I mean, lots of people try to push the prices up uh, uh, in recent years. I, it's still not really up there yet. I mean, maybe for the you know ones you know in very good nick and with full AMG kit and whatnot. But for normal models, you can definitely find ones uh, below 100K. I, I think you have a very good guaranteed future classic if you buy a 129. And another Mercedes models from that era I would recommend is the E-Class 124 series. Uh, particularly the C124, the two-door ones. I think those are very cool cars. Um, the the two-door E-Class, they, they are not that common, at least not in Hong Kong. Uh, again, very well built. I think they look great. And um, they just don't make Mercedes like that anymore. Now, in, in recent, I think in the recent 24 months, a lot of these 124 sellers have been quite optimistic and trying to sell them at um, quite high prices, above $100,000. Although from what I can see, there's absolutely no basis for that. I, I don't see any um, you know, market trend or auction trend in UK or whatever foreign markets that are bringing those values up. They are genuinely sub $100,000 cars um, that you can have for. And, and it will be a good investment, I think. And a good thing about these um, luxury 80s 90s mercedes is they were very popular um close to almost monopolizing the hong kong market back then so a lot of families actually bought these cars a lot of uh, affluent families back then bought these cars and and kept it for decades kept it for generations so um the you know low ownership low mileage examples on the second hand market of these 90s uh, mercedes are more common than you think. So if you really keep an eye out, um, you know, be, be persistent at um, browsing through classifieds, you can you know easily come across nice condition um, one two nines or one two fours. Now, finally, the final car I would um, propose for this price bracket uh, is an Italian, and it's actually the Maserati Quattro Porte Five. Now, if you watch my um, Quattro Porte One video you would know that the Quattro Porte 5 was made during the Ferrari Maserati era. So the, the cars were actually, you know, had a lot of Ferrari elements in there, including um, the engine block, which is shared with Ferrari models like the F430. Um, so I always liked uh, this era's uh, Maseratis. I think they, they were some of the best uh, performance Maseratis were made then, you know, given the Ferrari influence. 
And I think the um, Portrait Portrait 5 it was um, designed by Pinafonera. And I think the design is very timeless. It was very popular when it was new, including in Hong Kong. So the good news is there are a lot of them. And right now, they are very cheap. You can really have um, find a lot of them. That, are, that Even the asking price is below $100,000. Um, now, of course, being an old Maserati, maintenance fee would be high. Um, there will be things that you need to fix. It will cost more money than a, an old Mercedes. But, you know, if you want an Italian exotic, that's one to consider. And then also, you know, because there were so many examples, um, you can also from time to time find ones that have low ownership and low mileage. Uh, so that is uh, one pick I would make for this price bracket. Now, moving on to the second price bracket of um, $100,000 to $200,000. For for this bracket, I think immediately the obvious choice would be JDM cars. I think um, seeing my 22B video, as I've mentioned, there's a really strong JDM trend now across the, the globe, especially in Asia, where people are starting to buy back these older JDM performance cars. Now, of course, the special edition ones, as I mentioned, like the NSXR, have already gone, you know, the prices have gone through the roof, so I'm not talking about those. But I think some of the um, ordinary uh, editions of these JDM legends, uh, are, are, you know, they could be had for this price range between $100,000 and $200,000, and they, the value would likely continue to go up. And even if it does not, I think if you get a good condition one, the value would certainly not go down. So for this bracket, I think um, my personal favorites would be uh, Honda Type R's. Any naturally aspirated Honda Type R's, so your um, uh, DC5, EP3, DC2, FD2, I think those are, are worthwhile and worth buying, um, provided that you can find one that is you know, not distastefully modified, preferably original, and find one that has not been abused, um, you know, not with moon mileage. Now that is hard, that is hard. I mean, if you'll go to 28car.com, uh, many of these sort of JDM type hours are not, you know, they don't, they don't look like they're in good nick. Um, but if you come across one, or if you find one from Japan, uh, I, I do think it's a good buy. Same goes for the uh, Mitsubishi Evolutions and Subaru STIs. For this price bracket, I think you're talking about the version fives and version sixes, which were, truly legendary um, back in the, uh, in the time when they were new in the late 90s and whatnot. Um, so those are the cars I would certainly recommend. Um, another German brand uh, would be Porsche. I think Porsche uh, 996s are a very good value now uh, for that price range. Now for, for that price range, 100 to 200K, I, I, you're not, I highly doubt you'll be able to find a manual one. So you have to go for the Tiptronic one, uh, which is less desirable. But I think if you find the more um, special, not, not special, special editions, but you know, um, special models like the, the convertible, as opposed to just your normal carrier to a hard top, or the C4S, for example, the C4S looks very nice and they have just gotten below the $200,000 price point. Um, so the C4S is obviously the one with the um, turbo body, it looks great. Uh, so yeah, the, the more special 996 models um, that are within this price bracket, I think is worthwhile. Um, and moving to the Mercedes-Benz theme, as I mentioned, uh, first and foremost model that I would recommend for, um, for Mercedes-Benz for this price bracket would be the SL55 from the R230 generation. The reason being is um, for those of you old enough to remember when this car first came out, as I did, it was groundbreaking. I mean, the SL has obviously been a, a, around for a long time, but to have this super you know, muscular, um, super car level uh, SL being the 55 at the time, it was really something. I remember, you know, I was a student and I thought it was so cool. Supercharged V8 with 500 plus horsepower on a Mercedes. Uh, it sounds amazing, it looks sleek, the design is very modern and new at the time. And I think the engine won um, engine of the year uh, among the renowned um, Western car magazines back then. So it's a very, uh, uh, you know, a car that achieved a lot. 
and they can be had for um, quite cheap now, uh, below two hundred thousand dollars. Now, with the SL fifty five, the one of the major issues they are notorious for are the ABC suspensions, the self leveling suspensions. Um, those were very expensive to repair and rebuild when they were newer. But I I understand. I don't have experience in this, but I understand um, from what I hear outside that. Um, the garages have a lot of experience in fixing them now throughout the years so it's actually a lot more affordable to rebuild those abc suspensions so that is certainly something um, to look at another mercedes benz in this price bracket that i would recommend are the um, r171 slk 55s again very cool car slick design and it's, it's very cool that you know mercedes at the time stuck such a big 55 powerful engine into a small car. Now we should note that the 55 engine in the SLK is not the same as the one in the SL. Um, the one in the SLK does not have the supercharger, so it only has about 385 horsepower, which is plenty for a small light car like the SLK R171. So, um, but and also without the supercharger, uh, there's one less thing to go wrong, so the maintenance should uh, naturally be better than the SL55. The SLK55 also does not have the ABC suspension. I think they have the conventional suspension, so that is um, one less thing to worry about. There are a few BMWs that I would consider at this price bracket, um, mostly being the E36 and E46 M3s manuals. Um, you can't go wrong with that inline six M3 engine uh, in manual form. Uh, again, many of these you know are abused and molested by now, um, but I think good ones do show up from time to time. So that is something I would certainly uh, recommend. Oh, as well as the uh, Z3M Roadster, if you can find one. I think it's even harder to find one in good condition in Hong Kong than you know, ordinary M3s. The final car I want to recommend for this price range is another Maserati, being the Maserati Grand Sport. Now, for those of you who watch my channel, you know the Grand Sport have always been one of my favorite Maseratis. My family used to have one, and, and they're just very, very capable cars. Again, made during the Ferrari Maserati era, um, they were very cool cars, they look great. They are reliable if you maintain them properly, um, and they sound amazing, they, they're good size, they're very good GT cars for Hong Kong. And personally, I think it's a sin that they are so cheap now in Hong Kong. They are, you know, even the asking price is normally on the lower end of $100,000. Um, however, if you do want to find one, you better hurry because I think um, good condition, good example ones are getting less and less because they have been in this sort of cheap price bracket for quite a number of years by now. So um, they have gone through a few extra um, ownership changes. Some, if not most of them, you know, wouldn't have um, maintained the car properly given its low value. So if you want to find a Maserati Grand Sport, I think now is really, really the time. Now, moving on to the next price bracket of three hundred to $500,000. Uh, which I think is a very obvious choice and I never understood why they're so cheap and I myself had um, for many times when you know, was tempted to buy one but just never got the timing right is the Aston Martin Vantage manual those are have been asking price at the range of 200 something K for a few years already and it's unbelievable I mean the, it's such a beautiful car Aston Martin uh, its performance is good, amazing sounding V8 engine, uh, the interior is great. I have experience with one before and um, it drives great, the interior is great, the handling is actually very good. I think part of it is because of its short wheelbase. Um, the one thing I didn't really like about them is the clutch. I think the clutch feels very weird and it's unnecessarily um, heavy. And the um, Gear shifts are also a bit rubbery, but those are you know small problems for an, an Aston Martin that costs three hundred something thousand. Um, I mean, Aston Martin do have a reputation of very expensive parts, so maintenance will be expensive. But if you're buying that car for three hundred something thousand dollars, I think you can spend more on maintenance. I think it's fair. Um, another car, a JDM car that I would recommend at this price bracket is actually the Nissan GTR 35. 
Um, now it's still quite new that car relatively, but I, I do think it will just guarantee to be a modern classic, um, mainly because it made such huge impact when it first came out. Uh, the R34 before it was you know, discontinued many years before the 35 came along. Many of us thought we'll never see the GTR badge again. But then in uh, mid 2000, they started um, releasing information about this brand new GTR, which at the time, the technology it had was simply amazing. Um, it, it destroyed literally all of its rivals. Anything that could be comparable performance wise is cheaper than a lot of its European counterparts. Um, it's also um, past the era of the so-called gentleman's agreement. So it's, it no longer needs to have only you know, 280 horsepower. It's just an amazing car, you know, and, and, and with the influence of the, the generation that played uh, the Gran Turismo game, myself in, included. So I think the um, historical significance of this car and its competence and capabilities at the time and now would make it uh, a guaranteed future uh, classic. So if you can find one now, um, you should. I, I think it would be a good investment values would stay and go up uh, you know, in, in, a, in a few years time, I think. Um, and you know, as a JDM, many of them are, are modded now and many of them may have been abused and whatnot. But you will be surprised that there are some good um, samples that uh, shows up from time to time in, in second hand car websites. I, I recently saw one, which was, I think, you know, a local car, one hand, um, low mileage um, and, you know, being asking 400 something thousand. And I think that's very good value and, and a good car to put your money in. Now, before we go to our final category of $1 million, I just want to explain why I skipped the price bracket of sort of half a million to $800,000. Um, because again, this video is about cars that I think are good value, uh, the cars that I would consider myself. And I, I think the cars that I see, the second hand cars that I see in Hong Kong, um, at the price bracket of five hundred to 800000 they're not really good value cars. Uh, I think they are either cars that were that used to be cheaper, but the value has already gone up to that price range. Hence, it's not a good buy, um, such as you know, you know um, Honda NSX um, or some you know special edition Mitsubishi Evo, for example, that do trade at that price bracket. But that's because the prices have already gone up a few folds, so I don't think it's a good bargain to buy now. On the other hand, in this price bracket, there are more expensive cars that are still going through its depreciation curve. So for example, the Porsche 997 Turbo, a lot of them are asking for you know between six hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars now. And to me, they're still not a bargain to buy yet. Because if you look at the prices of the 996 turbos, the Tektronic ones, they go even further down. So that's why I think you know cars between Five hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars, you know, in that price bracket, it's hard for me um, to pick for the purposes of this video. So moving on to the one million dollar um, uh, cars, which I think are good to buy. Um, first and foremost, the Ferrari five fifty Maranello. Um, recently, there was one at um, Contempo Concept asking for one point oh eight million. And I think it was just sold um, a few days ago. But what more can you ask for? V12 Ferrari, the last uh, V12 Ferrari that was made only in manual, classic lines, classic look, you know, a tribute to the Ferrari Daytona at 1 million Hong Kong dollars. And that is, I mean, if I didn't have the 360 that I've invested so much money into already, I would have bought it in a heartbeat, no questions asked. So the 550 Marinello, if you can find one in good nick, and there should be. It's just a matter of whether they come out, you know, there for sale. Um, Five fifty Marinello is definitely my top choice for a good value future classic. Uh, the next one is the um, Lamborghini Gallardo and Manual. Uh, they do come up for sale from time to time, and I think you know they're rare manuals. They won't make them anymore. Again, you know, no questions asked, uh, and that would be something I would definitely consider. 
um, if I were in the market for a modern classic at $1 million. Now the final card that I would recommend for this $1 million mark would be the Porsche 997.1 GT3. Not the RS, just the GT3. This is actually my um, personal favorite because I always like the first generation GT3 look uh, for the 997. I think it, it's a very good balance between sleek lines and good looks and you know um, muscles. The GT3 RS sometimes are a bit on too muscular uh, than, than I like. So I think the 997.1 GT3 would be um, one that I pick. And, and for the longest time, since about 10 years ago, they were asking the value has gone up. They were asking about 1.1, 1.2 million dollars. And they kind of stuck at that price point for 10 years, literally. But recently, um, surprisingly, prices have softened up a bit, um, which is a bit of a sore point for me because, again, Contempo Concept had one, I think two months ago, asking $988,000. It was beautiful. It was in white with um, you know, racing sports seats and roll cage. I actually went to look at the car. It was in very good condition. The history was very good. And I really, really, really want to buy it because, you know, you all may know I don't have that many Porsche experience, but if you know, I never had a 911 before. If, if it was to be my first 911, that would have been perfect. But I have too many cars at the moment. I Therefore, I became sensible. I, I kicked away the man's math and I, I didn't buy it. And um, as expected, the car sold you know, immediately a, a, a few days later. So th those cars are around the 1 million mark now. I think Contempo has another one, which is asking 1.08 million. And to me, that is a very good value car because um, I'm not sure if values will go up anytime soon, but I really don't think it will go down from 1 million Hong Kong dollars. So that would be the final car that I um, propose for this video. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, let me know if, if you agree with my choices um, for cars that are good value now and have potential to be future classics. These are the cars that I would consider for myself. They are certainly not all cars that fit that category. I'm sure there are other cars that fit this, you know, good value, future classic status category. If you think I've missed anything, please put it in comments, in the comments section, what you think I missed, what cars do you think fit this category. And if you enjoyed this video, please give us a like please click the subscribe button and also click the bell button um, so that you get reminders when uh, we have a new video. And we will have new videos coming soon. Uh, in the meantime, please also take a look at our Instagram at InstacarHK. And if you like to read some of the blogs of some of the classic cars that I have reviewed, please also visit my blog at www.instacarhk.com. And have a good read. So thank you and I'll see you again soon.